Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Welcome to this, the ninth session in Artists Beyond the Studio Lectures by Graphic Studio Dublin during lockdown in 2021. This is the third series of the talks, and in this series, we're going to explore the ways in which artists interpret and reflect upon the world around us, presenting us with an altered lens through which to view and reflect upon aspects of our surroundings. There is an element of escape in this process, which appeals to me, jumping into the worlds presented and exploring new ways of looking at a problem or perhaps finding a solution. For the first in the series, we are going to travel to the Burren in County Clare, where Ailish Murphy works and lives at the moment. I hope we can explore the worlds of books and book arts that Ailish creates and also her insightful examination of contemporary society and communities. Ailish is a multidisciplinary artist, bookbinder and printmaker and a member of Graphic Studio Dublin. In 2020, she was awarded the prestigious Gordias Craft Award for her book arts practice, Folded Leaf. Folded Leaf is a publishing and bookbinding press set up by Ailish, which creates handmade limited edition books, often in collaboration with other creatives. Ailish is well known in the studio for her bookbinding skills and has led a group of members through a beautiful series of courses. She has a few of them properly hooked on the medium, I think. I am hoping Ailish will have time to also talk to us today about her wider practice as an artist, working in drawing, print, video, collage and collaborative community based actions. Her work observes, observes our relationship with spaces within our communities, often exploring the dialogue between public and private, drawing attention to the power structures and hidden narratives within. I'm fascinated by Ailish's use of juxtaposition within her imagery, placing the real beside the imagined, building ideas, and thoughts around some of Ireland's social, historical and ecological issues, ranging from ghost estates and abandoned cinemas to reproductive rights and Sheila and the gigs. The book and storytelling are a key part of Ailish's work, but she also draws attention to the historical importance of the printed word and the inherent power within our communities. I'm very interested to hear all about these different facets of Ailish's practice. Thanks for joining us today and welcome Ailish. So my name's Ailish. Um, so I um, I studied printmaking in NCAD in 2014. I graduated, um, and while in college, I was always um, exploring different mediums. I never really, in a way, stuck to one thing. Um, I was kind of drawn. Um, by many different techniques and I love making and um, I love uh, craft um, and I um, I suppose I'm just kind of a curious person so it's more maybe an idea that might lead me and then I'll think about oh, what process might work for that and um, so as Neve said I have a mix of work which would be uh, I do a lot of photo uh, photography but artist books, sound pieces, video. Um, but one thing that I think that it all hangs together on is collage. So I kind of view my practice as an artist and as a craft maker, um, as a collage of pieces that come together, that fit together. Um, and I find that, uh, I just think that's an important part of my process is just all these little elements that are floating around the whole time. And at some stage, they uh, make sense and connect together, but that mightn't be apparent um, from in the start. Um, so I'm gonna show you, um, this is some early work of mine. So it's from 2006. So I was two years out of college and I was doing a residency down in Westport in the Custom House Gallery um, and uh, uh, I have a kind of a close connection with Westport. I'm from Mayo, but we used to go on holidays uh, outside Westport. We had a caravan, so we used to go on holidays there every year. So I feel a deep sense of connection to uh, that place. So I started uh, creating a series of collages um, about, it was to do with memory and place and kind of, um, again, um, sitting side by side with reality and with maps and time and the passing of time um, and just kind of process wise um, I use a lot of um, say um, monoprints in my pieces so I just love the kind of quick and easy nature of them you can just they're just like drawing 
but also I love then photocopying stuff, which is a little bit controversial as a printmaker, <laughs> but I love the photo photocopier because I love that you can just blow things up and use things at a different scale and it just changes your view of them and kind of alters your perception of how they sit together, how they might fit together and how they're connected. So I really love um, kind of chopping into prints. So I rarely have editions um, because they end up getting kind of reused and recycled and cut into. And this could be years later too. kind of my work kind of drifts forward and back uh, over time. So I just wanted to show you throughout this, I'll just I kind of have dotted in artist books that I've created uh, alongside. Um, this was a book uh, that I made in 2010 and it's called Roll Call. Um, it's a, an alphabetical list of ghost estates in Ireland. Um, so at that time there were, I think it was over 600 ghost estates um, and I could really see that in the landscape too, um, especially in the area of East Mayo where I'm from. There were like there's just so many even still of these kind of um, very rough, uh, uh, like visually um, ghost estates, which are half occupied and half not. Um, so I made this book and um, I kind of, I uh, so I have an alphabetical list, as you can see in the second picture, um, I used kind of uh, tracing paper. So it's slightly see-through, slightly, I don't know, ephemeral or just not all uh, not all that tangible in a way, even though it is a very um, kind of blunt way of showing how many there were. And I was interested too in the mix of materials and technique. So the technique I used to bind this book, it's called a Coptic stitch. So it's an exposed uh, binding. And the Coptic stitch is actually uh, from has been used since 2 AD, which just kind of blows my mind. And uh, as a, a crafts person, I just love that about bookbinding because you're tapping into such an ancient craft. And yet I'm kind of putting a modern twist on it and using it in, in a different way than it would have originally uh, have it have originally evolved. But then uh, for the cover of this, I use really rough uh, plywood. So I kind of just wanted to uh, reflect kind of the shoddiness of the materials that were used in a lot of these ghost estates. So it's this kind of juxtaposition of um, kind of highly polished, high, uh, well made, and yet the materials are quite um, shoddy or questionable about kind of tapping into how long will they last um, and so on. So um, next, this was kind of a longer project that I did. Uh, it was called Uncommon Land. So how, uh, what this was, was it was a series of three flash mobs that I organized. And I do a lot of collaboration with other artists, activists, and anybody who was interested. Um, and I really enjoy that part of my practice. It kind of brings me out of my studio and also out of my head um, and introduces me to different ideas and perspectives. So this started um, from a residency I did uh, in Tala. It was with a group of 15 artists and we were um, brought out to Tala Cross, just where there was a building there where the Lewis line ends. And it was kind of around new media art, creating new media art together. There was no, no kind of uh, remit. It was very, very broad. Just the first day they went, oh, go out and see what inspires you. So that's what I did. Um, uh, but when I went out uh, to just outside the door, I started taking photographs and straight away I was stopped by security guards. And it turned out that the area, even though it just looks like a normal street and it has, you know, it has a, I don't know, is it Eddie Rockets or it has the library, just looks like a regular street. It's actually privatized. So in um, what you think is a public area is actually a privately owned area. And these areas have different rules, which are quite arbitrary. So in this area, one of them was you can't take photographs for no apparent reason. Um, so that I was really intrigued by that. So I decided to uh, organize a flash mob 
Um, so I'm going to play the video um, and I won't play it all, but I can just just give you a taste of what happened. Um, and the photos and footage are from the participants. Um, they gave me the footage afterwards, anything they took, they gave me the photographs. And then each of the photographs I geotagged, which was very laborious. <laughs> and then I put it up online onto Google, Google Maps. So it was kind of this play between the reality of being there and not being allowed to take photographs and then the virtual, um, you know, kind of flooding the area with the photographs of the area. Um, and I was just kind of interested um, in the kind of interplay between, between that. Um, and I found uh, with this project, uh, one of the things that has stuck with me, it's surprising when you put work out there, how long or how long of an effect it has because I've kind of moved on from this work, which is fine. Um, I still really uh, like this project, um, but I still get inquiries from, you know, students who are doing their theses or um, recently an art magazine got in touch about it and they wanted to do an article. And I find, I find that really interesting as an artist, you kind of put something out there and half the time, or not that I don't think about it, I, I do think uh, it through very clearly, but, the impact can be a lot longer lasting um, than I had would ever imagine. So I might just stop it there. Um, and these are all online on my website. So if you want to see them, <laughs> if you're feeling hard done by. Um, so um, that one flash mob, the first flash mob that I did led on to two others, which I did in the IFSC and then outside Facebook headquarters in Dublin. Um, and they became part of an exhibition in the Science Gallery um, called Hack the City, which was a really interesting exhibition. It was with other artists who were kind of subverting or doing unusual things in public spaces. So I was delighted to be part of that. Um, and the third flash mob, uh, the audience or visitors to the gallery could actually sign up for the third one, um, which was really great. So I got to meet loads of people who I would never have been in touch with before and who were genuinely interested in being there. So it was a fantastic uh, experience. Um, and you can see here in the background, here are all the photos that were taken at each flash, flash mob. So what I did for the installation, as well as the three video pieces, I had this vinyl map on the wall showing all the photographs. And I had a hand-drawn pencil map underneath, kind of showing them, placing them uh, where they were on the map in real life. So kind of after after that exhibition, I it was a very digital based uh, based exhibition. So I just wanted to make something more tangible, uh, something in the real world from it. Um, and what I did was uh, I showed you just in the previous slide the kind of vinyl sheet that was on the wall, stuck to the wall with the photographs. And um, it was this huge plastic sheet, and I just I'm just not into wasting things and also if it's plastic I really don't want to just ball it take it down from the wall and ball it in the bin so I it, it was kind of ridiculous but also a lot of fun I like slowly peeled it off the wall and then managed to stick it flat onto big pieces of paper which then I cut up and made into this artist book um, and I, that was a wonderful kind of finish for the project for me because it was bringing it back to making, which is hugely important. And I find when I'm making, um, I nearly, not to say that I stop thinking, but I just get so involved. And then ideas seem to sort themselves out in the back of my head without me having to like directly be focused on them. Um, yeah, so. Here is another project that I did, which was also a uh, collaborative participatory project. So this, um, I call this Mosquito Press. 
So for um, you might be familiar with the term, but if not, this was um, mosquito presses were around. Well, there's I think it's still used as a term, but in 1916 in Ireland, uh, there was loads of uh, that's just a tractor going by there. <laughs> um, there was loads of printed newspapers and pamphlets that activists used to make to get their message out there. That was the main tool for getting uh, what was happening uh, out to the public. Um, but obviously uh, the authorities did not want this happening. So these uh, guerrilla printing presses were kind of slapped down and shut as soon as they opened up. So hence the term mosquito press. So I wanted to do something around that uh, because it was 2016 and um, I thought I, it would be a lovely idea to set up a mosquito press. So as part of uh, pro-choice uh, march in Dublin, I um, organised a 1916 newsroom printing press. So it was for the kind of afters of the march. Um, about 300 people uh, participated in this in total, which was huge, and we didn't expect it to be that big. So it was very, very exciting. Um, and it was such a, just a, such an, an ex, um, kind of exhilarating atmosphere after that march. And I always find that I want to do something with that energy. So it was lovely to be able to provide this um, kind of uh, direction for people to put, to pour that energy or thoughts or feelings into. So what I did was we had copy girls. So there was about six of us and we had lovely aprons with uh, kind of copy girl written on. And we were kind of facilitating people uh, to engage with, with the newsroom. So you could come in, there was a typewriters so you could type up a story a poem and um, anything you wanted i also had um little uh pick uh, blank pieces of paper cut to the size of the newspaper columns where you could draw pictures or you could just write whatever you wanted to say and then I had also more kind of simpler ways to engage because not everybody wants to sit down and um you know to spend that much time so I had a wall where there were speech bubbles where you could just quickly write in something why you were there on that day and I found that was a great way of just getting people who wouldn't normally engage with art perhaps um, involved and kind of taking that first step and to see that they could be part of this and they can contribute and that their um, story our voice is really valid in this so, oh, and um, so there was also a donation box. So what you did, you wrote, you put, I think it was two euro in an envelope and you wrote your name and address on the envelope. And then afterwards, when I had edited the paper and printed it, you got the newspaper in the post about three months later. And people just loved that because it really was, it was like a capsule of, uh, that day and then just to get those feelings again of um, yeah it was pretty amazing so here's some shots um, of us actually in the newsroom and you can see the templates up on the wall there so it's actually you can see it's literally like old school copy with a bit of glue sticking it up on the wall which was really good fun and there's also people here too typing up all the stories and there was a kind of a group of people who come back and forth throughout the day and type up a bit go away come back um which was also lovely that it wasn't just this like single uh, engagement you could uh, take some time um, and come back to it so moving on now uh, this is kind of a long, I see this as a long term project, so it started in 2018. I worked, um, I should say I moved to the burn, so a different landscape, um, and I think a lot of my work has to do with uh, place and connection to place and memory. So my work has, tends to change wherever I am. Um, so I worked with about nine uh, farmers in the burn. So I went out with them when they were herding their animals. And I, I worked, there was 
farmers who had uh, cattle, sheep, goats, a donkey in one one place, and uh, it was it was just it was a lovely way of meeting people and actually being outside and working outside, which I just love being outside. Um, but why I did this was how it, how it started off was I happened to be just walking down the road in Connemara and there was a farmer in front of me who was herding cattle and I wasn't paying much heed I wasn't really tuned in but in the next minute he made this call and I actually just got such a shock because it was exactly the way my grandfather um, made herding calls and like I didn't know that I knew that sound it wasn't like I would have been out with my grandfather much if if at all, it was like this, this sound from so, so long ago that was um, deeply hidden inside me. And I just, I, I was so moved and just thought, oh, I have to do something around this. Um, so yeah, so I worked with these farmers recording their calls and I'm just really interested in the idea of this kind of intergenerational um, intergenerational communication so you know calls herding calls being passed down from parent to you know son or daughter um, but also this interspecies communication which I just think is amazing and that that is passed down intergenerally inter through generations of you know cows and their calves and there's something really beautiful about that and that connection which is kind of dying away um, in places. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to play about a minute or so of a sound piece I made. So this is a collection of herding calls and um, I call this a herding orchestra. Herding by Ailish Murphy. I'll stop it there. Um, I hope you're able to hear that okay. Um, so I just love how just even when I'm listening to that I kind of get transported back to being out um, in these sometimes enclosed areas on the landscape and you can hear the crattle of sticks breaking you know through this kind of forested area but then onto the openness of uh, the burn and these um, calls kind of bouncing off the rocks and traveling through the landscapes and I just I love even the idea of like how long have these sounds been um, you know, bouncing off these rocks for millennia, and um, who knows? Um, and I, I don't know, that's something that I'm just kind of intrigued by. So, <coughs> sorry, I just wanted to show a notebook sh uh, shot. So this is kind of an important part, which I think gets hidden in an artist practice. Um, I have a lot of notebooks, unsurprisingly, because <laughs> I'm always just kind of making books. Um, but I tend to use notebooks. Uh, I have loads on the go at the same time. I don't start one and work through and finish it. I kind of pop in at any page and even sometimes start at the back. And I think that kind of links back to my process of making as being a bit of a collage. It's, I love going back into notebooks and then finding something and realizing, oh yeah, that makes sense now. It didn't make sense when I was drawing it. I wasn't really sure why I was doing that. But now the work I'm doing, I can see where this has come from and I tend to reuse things. And again, kind of photocopying, blowing things up and uh, 
you know, using them in another way. Uh, these drawings were made from around that time and I was kind of just looking at materials that farmers were working with and using every day or coming into contact every day. So, um, oh, and here is a pretty recent project of mine. So this was a collaboration um, with a poet. And as I mentioned, I, I work with a lot of different people, but I do collaborate quite a lot with uh, artists and writers and whoever really wants to collaborate. Um, but I find the artist book is just such a great way of collaborating because while you can do anything, I think, um, it's still kind of a, I don't want to say set format, but you you kind of have a focus or a container for your ideas and how they come together. Um, so this was a two year collaboration that I did with Grace and how it started was we were just posting snippets of our work back and forth to each other. And um, so, you know, there could be a two days gap, but then there could be a month's gap in between when you would get something and uh, it, it was a lovely interruption and I realized that I really enjoy that in my work and I think that's why I enjoy working with other people and um, I can get very kind of uh, focused on the one project and then that's just all I'm thinking about and my head's nearly stuck in there but then when something would land through your door this random you know two lines of a poem and it would just shift my focus and make me think in a different way both in our collaboration but also in my own work so just I love being uh, kind of introduced to different viewpoints or different thought processes or work processes, uh, well, uh, work processes. Um, so how this book came about was then after uh, many months, uh, we had a three day workshop where Grace came to the burn and we worked together and we kind of teased out like common themes in our work that had uh, unfolded over the months of posting stuff back and forth and responding to each other's work. Um, and then we uh, created this book together um, and kind of themes that we were really interested in were kind of the ideas of time being stretched or unfolding and also creating meditative uh, spaces um, and a meditative space within a book. Um, and I think one thing I love about this book is you can't actually see it, but there's a bookmark in the back. And I just love it's uh, I think maybe about 28 pages in the book, but I find it quite I, I, um, I just find it a bit comical that you have a bookmark, but yet it just kind of uh, kind of encourages you just to slow down and pause and that you could you can dip in and out of this book at any point and then just come back to it. You don't have to read it through. And that's not the idea of this book. Um, yeah, and that's that's something I quite enjoy as a concept. And oh, also we hand bound them together, me and Grace, which was lovely. Um, and it was just it was in, I think, August we hand bound them and we had a launch in September um, and it was just like a really brief a moment where COVID restrictions were lifted and we had this outdoor launch um, in the burn where we had kind of a creative writing and bookmaking workshop which was just so beautiful now looking back it was uh, one of the, kind of the high point I think of my year um, and this is the last uh, uh, project I'm going to show. Uh, this is my most recent art, artist book and um, it's called Words About Words and it was actually exhibited in the Graphic Studio Gallery um, out over at Christmas. So uh, it's a book with 26 collages um, and it's they're quite esoteric words about language um, and how this came about was a friend of mine um, was moving to Oxford to become a lexicographer. And I, I'd i never heard the word before and I just thought it was hilarious. I never thought about like, obviously there's people who work making dictionaries and um, so it just kind of triggered this uh, want in me to look up these unusual words about language or to make a collection of them. And it was just, 
um, I just made a little list, uh, like a typed list, which I gave the going away present firm, but that was kind of the start of a bigger project looking at language and use of language and also trying to, um, I don't want to say quite illustrate because they're not really illustrations, but uh, to uh, visually verbalize uh, unusual words. So I have a little video which shows just a flip through of the book. So I made handmade 250 of these, and that's uh, one of my biggest uh, handmade editions of my own artist's books uh, that I've made so far. So I was pretty uh, pleased with that. Um, so just maybe a little, oh, I keep sending this, a little bit about the process. Um, again, it was, I kind of saw it as a, nearly like Pictionary. Um, where you're given a word and how how do you how do you uh, illustrate it? Um, so I have lots of different paper. I collect a lot of paper, so I collect a lot of old magazines uh, from secondhand shops, and people give me them. Um, I surprisingly I sound like a hoarder, but I'm not actually that much of a hoarder. Um, I tend to go through the magazines, and I know quite quickly what appeals to me. So I might I, I tend to rip out pages and keep them, and it could be like six years later when I use them. But I have a certain aesthetic, or I'm drawn to certain things, and I understand that and kind of trust that. So I don't. Feel Feel like I have to hold on to everything. So when I was making this book, I oh, I tend to work on the floor also. So I sit down, I take out all, all my papers, and I just find when when you see you, when you see all of these, say this is a scrap of a rubbing, which I did, um, and it's off wallpaper that's in one of the rooms in our house. And here's some paste paper that I made, and here's a uh, from an old kind of book about Mexico. Um, I find that when everything is laid out in a jumble around me, I, I make different connections that I would never make otherwise. Um, I, you, a lot of the stuff I'd never pair it up and go, oh, maybe this thing over here and take it, another thing from over here. But suddenly when they're mashed together, um, they kind of speak to each other in a different way. So I really enjoy that process and I find that I make decisions quite quickly. Um, one thing I do is I don't uh, try to create, I don't analyze at all. I just create, I get stuck in. Um, I just think that creating something and analyze something, it's just a very different process. So I make the collages and I make a lot of them and sometimes I work very quickly um, and then I leave them. So for a few days or it might be a week and then I come back to them and then I kind of relook and go, oh, does that work? Uh, could that be better? How, how could I change that? Um, so, yeah. And oh, I thought I'd just put a bit of a book binding video in. Um, so this is just a short video showing me putting on one of the covers. So this is the paste paper that I mentioned before, and I know a few people here have made that with me. Um, it's a really fun and beautiful way of making pattern paper. It's a little bit like uh, finger painting for adults, <laughs> but um, it's been around since again, since like the 16th century. It's a little bit like the equivalent of marbled paper. It's just another way. Um, so again, I just love that tapping into the history and techniques and just, yeah, using them in another way. The white tool that I'm using um, is a bone folder. And again, it's a really old tool. It's traditionally made out of cow bone, but the one I'm using there is actually a Teflon one. And I kind of use a mix of both. Uh, they both work in different ways. Um, Teflon slides and bone, full, bone grips. So, <laughs> and 
yeah so it's handy for different different things so that's uh, kind of the end of my presentation um, and I just thought I'd end with a kind of where to next um, so I this is literally this week uh, I've been planting 600 trees on land that I've bought with my partner and a friend uh, so I'm really really excited about that um, and I think it's something that's in my head a lot is climate breakdown and just it's just so colossal but I don't really know how to make work about that so I think this is my work around that and that it will grow into something else um, and I also have a couple of collaborations on at the moment with um, an artist and another writer um, which I'm really excited about too so thanks very much Thanks so much, Eilish. That was absolutely amazing. Um, really, really, I think I could listen to that um, herding orchestra all day. <laughs> very, very nice on your collages. I think I'd love to see an exhibition of them. Like oh. big exhibition of collage pieces, you know, they're, they're, they're just so they're so thought provoking. They're, there's just so much going on. I just love hearing you talk about all the different fragments and the way that you work and, and piecing them all together. Um, I'm sure people have some questions. I'm going to I'm going to start off with one. I'm just wondering like has has anything about your practice changed since you moved to the burn and like is there anything that you miss? I'm sure there's loads that you love being down there. I'm slightly jealous. But is there anything that you miss from, you know, for, about living in Dublin? Um yeah, I think my practice changes wherever I'm living. So um you can kind of see the shift between quite urban work and you know the, the themes are very uh, you know street based and people based whereas now I've kind of um you know moved away from that and it's kind of more land based and working with uh, a lot less people maybe but maybe kind of deeper connections. Um, so yeah, I think I just, um, whether I want to be or not, I'm kind of inspired by where I am. Um, in terms of missing things from Dublin, um, I actually I usually feel like I have to pretend. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, though I, I do miss the studio and it's harder to, sorry, the graphic print studio and going up there. Yeah, I miss that part of it for sure. So thanks. And are you able to print at all where you are? Have you any, have you any set up? Um, well, I kind of, I'm getting quite into lino prints and okay. I think I've always loved anyway, uh, just kind of DIY, quite quick, quick processes. Um, I've never been into etching or anything like that. Like in college, I loved screen printing and I can do that here. Um, I, I do love uh, lithography also. Um, but I'm more drawn to uh, whatever I can do right here, right beside me and whatever materials, oh, I have masking tape. So I'll do something with that rather than uh, look too far away. It looks, it looks like you've a lovely, lovely setup there, you know, it's nice when you've yeah. found a good, good spot. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else got any questions for Eilish? Just a quick question uh, from Paul here. Um, Eilish, when you left college, did you find it sort of difficult to sort of launch off on any particular project or just to get started or, or how, how, how did you find just coming out of college and, and making your way? Um, I was really lucky, actually, because I won uh, the CAP Foundation Award. I don't know, is that still around? Um, but what it is, is it's this, uh, they're called the CAP Foundation. They uh, selected two students each year um, from NCAD and provided them with this like stunning studio to work in, purpose-built studio, and then with an exhibition as part of that. So that was a lovely kind of cushion uh, leaving college. But still, I think the transition is quite hard because then the next year it was just like, oh, what do I do now? Um, because I was always juggling um a lot of different jobs a lot of different types of work so i did a lot of office temping and random stuff but i also used to do um again a lot of art facilitation which i really enjoyed but um when the crash happened in 2008 that just like completely disappeared overnight um, and that was uh you know a little bit of a reality check um so i just i think that's also too why 
I set up, not that I set up Folded Leaf for that reason, but why I became more interested in that, because it seems like a sustainable art practice that I can, you know, I can have, make a living off. Um, whereas I found that working for other people, it can just disappear overnight. Um, so I was quite uh, purposeful in, um, in heading in this direction. Hi Eilish, thanks for that. It was so inspiring. Fabulous to see all the different things you're involved in. But I just wanted to ask you about the project um, on common land. Uh, I think it's amazing you got the exhibition up uh, showing the photographs, but I just wonder how difficult that was for you, you know, to get the permission and what kind of loops did you have to go through to uh, get the exhibition together? Um, could you say the permission from who? Like, you know, you weren't allowed to take the photographs, so did people stop you or did you have to get permission or did you just go ahead and do it anyway? Well, I think that was kind of the point of it for me. Mm. It was kind of like art and activism. It was highlighting that, like, why is this the case? And part of the flash mobs was being stopped. Um, it wasn't meant to be contra uh, what do you call it? Confrontational. confrontational. Yeah. 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 It wasn't meant to be that, but it was just more like exposing these areas in Dublin for what they are and kind of questioning like why, why, who makes these rules? Why are these rules here? Um, so I didn't have many qualms about getting permission from anybody. And I think I just made it very clear to the participants um, that they might be stopped and also um, kind of had a good conversation around what to do if you're stopped because... <laughs> You know, it's it's nothing to do with that security guard, or it, it's not in that way. It's just um, having yeah. a conversation about it, and uh, yeah. So, and did did you get any feedback from the owners of the streets or the buildings or those who were trying to stop you? Um, well, the thing is, so the one in Tala is actually owned by Nama, and that's what really interested me because I was like, yeah. oh, I kind of own this. We all own yeah. this. There you go. I'm going to take photos of this. <laughs> Whereas the ones in the IFSC, they're a little bit more murky because they're owned, they are, you know, there's a lot of scandals around uh, around who owns that and kind of, what do they call quangos, I think? Very unclear ownership, kind of these private part, public partnerships, but they're not really, and it's not really clear who owns what. Um, and there is a uh, I know there's a lot of tension between Dublin City Council and the IFSC. Uh, I just can't remember the name, sorry, but sorry. over ownership, um, who owns what and who min maintains what and all that. And I find that fascinating too, because it's kind of like all these hidden, it's nearly like a map of Ireland that has, you know, a jigsaw that you get as a kid and they're different colors and all these, you know, kind of boundaries between things that you don't see in reality mm -hmm. and when there's like layers of this bureaucracy and yeah, I, I really liked that as well and it, and it is a big issue because as our um, streets have become closing down in a sense and if, if you look at places like Dunleary where there might be 50 empty shops and two shopping centres but the two shopping centres are exactly what you're talking about they're private space and the street, which is public space, is uh, dying, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Eilish. Yeah. I know um, as well as doing your own work that you do take on kind of production work of the most beautiful photo albums and um, books and whatever for other people. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I kind of have, well, uh, yeah, as Neve mentioned, actually, I won the RDS Craft Award um, last year, and that has had like a huge impact on my whole um, practice, but also the way I view my work. Um, because uh, when, when I actually went for that interview, I was very much like, I make wedding albums and I make these books and I'm not going to tell them anything about my art practice because that's, they don't want to hear about that. Like, I, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and, um, so I have um, 
just changed my view through the help of uh, actually Roisin uh, de Butler, who is a glass artist, and she's also the chair of the RDS Craft Award. And I asked her, would she mind mentoring me over the year? And that has been like an incredible experience. And um, so she has helped me realize that my art and my craft, they're one and the same. They all feed in and out of each other. Um, and kind of with that in mind, I've pulled back a lot from making albums and making notebooks because I, I'm not, not to say that I'm not all that into that, but what really inspires me is when I'm working with other artists. So I love working with, uh, as I said, like writers, artists to collaborate and make artist books. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on anymore. Um, and I've kind of changed my website a little bit <laughs> because of that. Um, so, for instance, I'm working, I'm going to be working with um, Mary Ruth Walsh, who is an artist who has an exhibition, Skin Deep, coming up. And uh, we're collaborating on, I'd say, what normally would be a catalogue, but it's going to be an artist book as part of the exhibition. Um, so an addition of however many, but very kind of unusual structure. And I'm really excited about that. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm doing more so now. Um, what artists inspire, have inspired you or do inspire you? Or, and do you follow any particular threads of practice? Um, thanks. Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I'm a little bit, I kind of go back to the whole collage thing again. I kind of, um, I don't think there's any main one artist that I would follow, but uh, I find actually Instagram, I'm a little bit hooked at the moment, <laughs> as a lot of people are with COVID, but I follow a lot of artists there and I really, really enjoy that. And actually I follow a lot of members of the graphic studio and I love seeing your work. Um, and I think it was an Aoife, Aoife Scott put up uh, her notebook the other day and that actually ins you know inspired me to put my notebooks in this talk so I was like oh yeah like I find that endlessly fascinating you know hearing about my contemporaries uh, process of working and um, so that would be a big influence and then um, in terms of other artists um, well there's Red Fox Press in Ackle Island they do amazing art books and I just love their work. Um, and the there's a, a, um, there's a few other, oh, Mermaid Turbulence or another uh, artist books. They're not uh, active anymore, but they still sell their books and they're, they're just really fascinating, really kind of dense, um, beautiful uh, books. Um, and then other artists, uh, kind of over, say, bigger artists. I love Max Ernst and uh, Rachel White Reed, and Matisse. Um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Did, yeah. you, did and if you don't mind a supplementary question, did NCA prepare you for what you do now, or is what you're doing now a reaction against how you were taught in NCAD? NCD. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. It's. I. I think what something that gave me a bit of a lesson <laughs> was, <coughs> sorry, the uh, crash in two thousand and eighteen. Um, I think I was very focused on uh, doing a lot of um, facilitation work, art facilitation, and just when that disappeared, I kind of really realized, okay, if this is ever going to work for me, I have to be a little bit more strategic about this and really build up my own work and my own practice and kind of be more steady in myself rather than looking out externally for work. Um, and in terms of NCAD, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'd change. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, learning print and I loved the hands-on skill of that. Um, I think definitely, I think it's changed a lot since I was there and I think they do give you a lot more practical advice for uh, after college because that was pretty minimal I would say when I was there. Hey Eilish, it's Neve McQueen here. I just wanted to uh, hi, say hi and also to ask you a little bit about you know I suppose contemporary collage. I'm just very interested in your take on it and um, particularly just collage. It's 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 amazing that I suppose you've got your 
activism and that's so closely linked as well and the print angle of collage being integral um maybe just have another few words a few minutes of <laughs> you're talking about that yeah trying to think <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose I was more, I suppose, do you, I, maybe what's it like, you know, are there other collage artists that you are aware of in, say, in Ireland or internationally that you can see a new resurgence of it or? Um, I'm not, not too sure. I suppose I follow a lot of uh, artist bookmakers and there's, yeah. a huge, um, there's a huge use of collage in that because I think nearly like a page is, is like a collage. You're piecing together all these uh, pages together so it you know if you took them all apart it would be a collage a huge collage of ideas and mm -hmm. uh, so I'm trying to think more I have I suppose I just I'm constantly looking at books of collage artists and terrible with names so I can't really remember any but I I suppose I'm really drawn to um artists who use drawing so even like pencil are very paired back kind of line drawing you who use them in their collages Guinness. yeah that's really unusual isn't it yeah I just I just think it's so beautiful um and I love uh actually what I do loads of actually is rubbing so just taking you know with a crayon up yeah. against the wall or wherever and I just love the contrasts between textures and lines so you can have this very um kind of paired back drawing but then juxtapositioned with this um you know just mm. a quite intense texture and uh yeah just how they react or respond to each other um I, I think you know sometimes I'd go out for a walk and I just get sucked into like looking at an old wall that has like peeling peeling paper and you know peeling paint or whatever and just kind of the layers and layers of of color and kind of history and time that has passed and um, it just is quite fascinating oh thanks yeah thanks for you nice. <laughs> thanks so much Eilish that was inspiring and enlightening and um I think everyone uh, got a lot out of it Re really nice to to get an insight into what you get up to down there and and you know like there's so much going on in your practice um it's really really nice for us to to get a to get a look at it thanks everybody um if you want to see more of Ailish's work obviously the folded leaf website and there's a few of her prints up as well on our graphic studio website